Okay, so uh, folks, um, uh, we're going to be proceeding now to uh, the first of our really interactive sessions uh, with that discussion of principles, motivation for um, system science and, and discussion of the role that dynamic models play. We're actually going to be interacting here with uh, some dynamic models. Um, and uh, I'm gonna use this to, uh, to see some concrete uh, manifestations of the sort of principles we've, we've just been seeing. Sorry, sorry, what, oh, thank you. Yeah, thanks, um, good. Um, so uh so within this context yeah i i don't need it yet i i want to i want to show something first um so uh here we're going to be going through an example model together and using those to illustrate using that model to illustrate the some of the features of asian based models that are responsive to these needs of system science in the broader enterprise of dynamic models. Uh, so uh, to that end, uh, I would like you to, and I'm gonna share my screen here so you can see this component. Uh, can you see my uh, Google Drive here? Okay. Online, yes. Uh, oh, okay, yeah, 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 okay. Good, thank you. Um. So here we have uh, Google Drive, and uh, I have navigated to this second URL listed up here, this tinyurl.com slash avmbootcamp2024, okay? Um, for those who are online, I'd refer you to this same bootcamp here. Uh, it's this one right here. Uh, tinyurl.com ABM Bootcamp 2024, okay? If you navigate to that, you should see something like the follow. Um, it should be a set of participant resources, including many of those things of which I spoke earlier, uh, the schedule, but also background materials and discussion of hallmarks of complex systems and a set of so one of those subfolders is named any logic eight examples. So I, I want to do a level set here. Are people uh, online and uh, in the room? Are you able to? Thank you, Wade, for posting that in the chat. Are you able to see this? Okay, uh, online. Okay, okay, I'm. Anyone having trouble with this? Okay, because this is gonna be a step that we will undertake time and time again throughout this week, writ large, okay? Um, okay, now when you're presented with this, you know, there'll be many resources here. Good, thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Khan, okay. Um, we're gonna to go to the AnyLogic8 example folder. How did I do that? Well, we came here with that URL, the tiny URL, and I'm gonna double click on AnyLogic8 examples. And you should see something like this. Uh, a, a broad list, nay, a cacophony of example models from anemia to issues of substance abuse and addiction, to concerns involving diabetes and trust networks, uh, to interaction of, of weight and service delivery uh, for diabetes, oral health, uh, spread of infection, smoking disparities, a, a wide set, okay? What I would like you to do now is sort this cacophony, lend order to this madness, okay? So to that end, uh, I'd like you to go here to this name and you'll see a little a little thing going 
little arrow pointing down. Um, and I'd like you to press it. And you should see these now uh, in an alphabetical order. Okay. Okay. Um, please uh, indicate with your hands up um, uh, any problems that you're encountering. Um, and we will uh, we'll, uh, get a TA to help you out. But what did I do? I, I came to this, any logic aid examples and I clicked on this, this little arrow so that it points upwards. But basically the key thing is that it's in alphabetical order. Okay. Are we okay with that? Are people tracking? Okay. Okay. Now, again, we're going to be doing this again and again. So forgive me for, for following through this very systematically. I'd like you now to scroll down and find a model called Neighborhood Mobility version 12, V12. Okay, so you're going to go down that sorted list. Sorted, not sorted. Um, <laughs> list. And and there's a, there's a folder called Neighborhood Mobility. Do you see that? Okay, I'd like you to double click on that. And in that, you will find a file. The goal of your quest. Okay, this is file. Do you see that? Um, now, I'm going to make my screen a bit larger because um, uh, maybe, it, maybe it's too small for you to see, but it should look something like this, neighborhood mobility. Do you see that? Okay, now again, I'm good. I'm I'm going through some basic life skills here for the boot camp. So there's two things you can do here. And the youngsters in the room can probably tell me several others more. I can right click on this and do download with this context menu that pops up. Alternatively, through this dot dot dot, I could click that and do download. You can avail yourself of your choice of those two methods. If you feel more comfortable with the dot, 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 you can do download through that. Otherwise, you can do it through here. But one or the other, you should instruct it to download this file. And downloading it, it does. Okay. Now, as it downloads it, it's going to put it, to place it, in your downloads folder, okay? So downloading this, I think this should be, if we're on, on the ground in terms of understanding, download something, right, from the web, it goes to your downloads folder. Now what we're going to do is fire up our any one. Ladies and gentlemen, start your engine, okay? Okay. Um, so uh, to that end, we will go over here and I'm going to find any logic on my computer. How will I do that? I'm going to press this start button and I'm going to say any logic. I don't have to type it all out. Even just the any, I think, will, will get us the choice. Um, okay. And I'm going to click here. You could also click here and maybe you. Anyway, um, again, maybe the youngsters could tell me if there's a better way to do this, but this is this is the way that I know. Um, and as they say in China, the old horse knows the way. La Ma sure too, right? <laughs> okay, um, okay. So any logic comes up, okay? Um. Up comes any logic, and you may see this splash screen. If this is the first time uh, uh, that this has come up for you, you may see this screen, which provides you a set of resources. And there are indeed, as, as the name would suggest, some useful resources here, some tutorials and, and other information, et cetera. But our interest here lies elsewhere, dear viewers. Um, specifically, uh, oh, there also may be a little thing that comes up and says, ah, there's a new version available. Um, blah, blah, blah. Um, 
and you should say close. Wade is asking um, with, with judicious forethought whether there are any Mac or Linux users, because if so, the process will be mildly different in terms of starting any logic. Is that what was on your mind, Wade? Yes. Yes. Okay. So if you have any logic up, you're you're past that point where you have to worry about that. The interface to any logic should be pretty much the same. Okay. Does does do people have any logic up? Okay. Okay. Uh so could someone else uh sit is is that with uh uh Meti or someone else? So Okay. Okay. So, so why don't you go get the tech staff? If you want to get the tech staff, go do so. I'm just trying to make sure someone else can work with them while you're gone. Okay. So ladies and gentlemen, when we called this up, um, uh, if you have this splash screen up, what we want to do is minimize it using yonder widget. Um, forgive me for lapsing into the technical vernacular, this little thing that says minimize, this little bar. Okay, so you'll, you'll up in the upper right, if you have this splash screen, you're going to minimize it. Okay? And you should see something like this. If you've opened any logic before uh, or configured it, you may, you may see something over here on projects. Okay? But broadly, it should look like this. Do you see something roughly like this? Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Are people is is anyone online need some help here? Is I'm going through this uh, methodically. Does anyone anyone need help? This is a great time to reach out if you're having any trouble here. But we're we're looking to have uh, an opening screen for any logic here. Ah. Uh, okay. Enter the dragon. Um. Okay. So. Um, you're going to go up to the file menu and say open. Okay. File open. Okay. Was that issue resolved? No. Okay. File open. And you're going to go to using this button here downloads. Now on a Mac, or Linux, this may look subtly different. Is that way, right way? But basically, there should be a menu here which allows you to go to downloads. It, it may just look, it, the details of it may look different. Is that a true statement, Wade? Yes. Okay. Thank you. So, downloads. Okay. And truth, truth is, I, I downloaded this model twice. So, there's going to be two of them. But, but in any case, you will see one of these with the name neighborhood mobility version 12.alp. Do you see that? Okay. Now, um, I need to highlight the fact that, that the, the use of this model was anticipated for this exercise that, that we are, on which we are embarking here. Okay, so if you look at the schedule, this model is mentioned by name. There. And in general, I try to anticipate for a given session what models we will use, and you can always preload them if you'd like to do so. You can play with them ahead of time if you'd like to do so. But right now, this is the one that's mentioned in the schedule for this session. So I am going to press the open button. Alternatively, I could double click it. I will press, I will elect to press, so I will select it and press open. So I'm selecting it. I could double click in it or I could just press open. I'm gonna so I selected it and I'm gonna press open. And it will it will open. Okay. Uh and any logic is opening this this model. Okay. Um now when the model opens, you will see information about that model, about the structure of that model depicted in the left most panel. This panel uh, called projects here on the left. Okay. Now, um, uh, th there's lots of uh, detail to be discussed there, but broadly we will see that this is a model that includes many pieces. 
they'll be intertwined pieces. They'll be pieces that have relationships to one another. And the behavior here, just like in the world, will be greater than the sum of the parts. What are these pieces here? Okay, recognizing they're far from the only story. It's the interaction between them. But what are they, these building blocks? What are these templates out of which the model is made? Well, um, we see that there's one called main, M-A-I-N. There's one called person. And then there's a set of others called things like school, workplace, community place, and home. I'm going to double click on main. In fact, main is already shown. You could see it in this area here. So we have those projects. And if we double click on things here, um, we, we will see it on this this uh, canvas in the middle, okay? We'll see that, oh, okay, in Maine, Maine is the stage on which these agents will strut. It's the, it's the broader context um, uh, in which this, the events, the model will take place. It's kind of the overarching environment for this model and for internal people. Uh, this holds across many models, uh, in fact, virtually all. So we have main here. And what we'll see here is that it consists of several pieces. There's a population of people. That's the population here. You can click and see it's a population um, of agents. Um, it's a person agents. And then there's a collection of community places, a collection of, a, a, a collection of homes, a collection of workplaces, and a collection of schools. This dot, dot, dot with the square brackets indicates it's it's a collection of them. So we have a collection of people and then a bunch of homes, workplaces, schools, communities. And and then there are these things down here, which which are shown as sort of pie slices. Oh. Uh, but uh, represent assumptions, so parameters. And so there's a parameter encoding, for example, the uh, uh, whether uh, right now work is open. Um, in fact, there's one up towards the top, just left, lower left of that um, collection there, that's called population size. Um, what's the size of the population we want to have for this particular run of the model? Um, uh, there's others here um, that are, for example, whether school is open for this uh, for this run, whether work is open. So there, there are assumptions when running the model that encode what to assume when running the model. Okay? Um, and there's some other pieces too we'll be learning about. These things called B, which are variables, and a, an F for function. Okay? That, that sort of captures it. A piece, a piece of logic to, to undertake the task. Okay. Um, so this model is built up out of the pieces, but I want to delve into one of them in more detail. Okay. One that itself will be composed of interlinked. Hmm. Um, uh, and, and then we'll talk about the interplay between these. Because again, the behavior of these models is a reflection not merely the pieces, but the interconnections between. So we're gonna dive in. This population is population of person. You can see it up there after the dash. So I'm going to expand that. I'm gonna go over here, I'm gonna double click on person. Jenna is asking a question. Yes. I can, I can. That That is a, a request on which I can deliver um, with some gusto, no less. Is that acceptable? Okay, okay, there we go. Um, is this is this better? Okay, for those in the room, this may afford you an, an easier look. Okay, so I double clicked on person and it brought up a new tab of this canvas. And, and this, this tab allows us to see so that people, the, the assumptions and or the particulars about a person. So a given person has certain assumptions about it. They have a home, they have an age and years, they have a school, and they have a workplace associated with them. Um, and uh, and they, they have certain types of behaviors, uh, these functions like visiting the community and connected to nearby places. 
but they have behaviors that are encoded by what are called state charts. Now, I'm gonna show you something which may help here. And it was more or less forced by the size of this presentation. Um, I zoomed in and you know, it became larger than life. So I'm going to go zoom in on this so I can see a little bit more real estate. Right now, this kind of the windows are a bit crowded. So I'm gonna zero in on this particular tab. Um, this is a bit of kind of use of this interface. So I'm gonna double click on this tab. So I double clicked on person. Now, this is, this is something we call uh, toggling between modes. And, um, and I don't know how widespread that term is these days, but if I double clicked on it again, I'd get back to where I was. So uh, in terms of the view, all this does is kind of lets me zoom in on this and then zoom out again so I can change my focus if I wish to. So here we have these different, uh, these different windows. But if I just want to focus on this canvas, I can click on double click on person, and then it uses the full full screen to best effect to, for, to depict that person. So here, what we see in front of us is important. It it has it essentially reflects principles I can measure. I spoke earlier about how models capture data. Not merely theory, but operationalized theory. Theory that's specific enough, precise enough in its assumption. Not that precise doesn't mean accurate, but specific enough, unambiguous enough in its assumptions that allows us to ask what, it, what is the logical consequence of this in terms of behavior over time. It's specific enough we can run the model if I can lapse into a technical vernacular. And here, we see theory of personhood as captured by person. We can think of person as defining a template for person. It's like a cookie cutter thing, right? When we, when we build a batch of cookies, I build batches of cookies. Yeah, you can, yeah. Uh, to forgive, uh, when we cook a batch of, when we bake a batch of cookies, we use like a shape, right? To carve out a certain shape. Maybe it's a reindeer shape or a Santa shape or something, right? We have this, we have this, so the template we use to build to build different cookies. We have one template we use it to build many cookies. This is a template for person, for what it means to be a person in this model. Person what person this is described by this. So we have a theory of being a person. And what does that theory involve? Well, it's a simplification of reality. How so? Well, what does it involve? Well, it involves some assumption about their home, some assumption about this person's age, school, or workplace. Um, but it also involves some assumption about their location right now and how that changes over time. This is, you may remember, the word for this was state chart. And it codes at once the set of possible states they could be in with respect to this particular concern, their location. It describes the actions that change that state, for example, departing on a commute to work. And... And then the rules that govern when those assumptions take place. For example, if we click on um, commute to work, if we were to click on this little link there, we would actually see some assumptions. But to do that, we'd have to zoom out here. And we could, I just double clicked on this to zoom out so I could see this window over here. And I could click on this and I'll say, oh, leave, leave home after 14 hours of being at home. You will commute to work, but only if your age in years is greater than 18 and the workplace is open, which is this other condition. So if your workplace is open and your age is greater than 18, after 14 hours at home, you will you will leave for work. Okay. Um, and similarly for school, how do you think the, uh, the um, condition for leaving for school might be different? How do you think it might be different? Different age. Different age range, yeah. So here, they'll leave for school if they're less than or equal to 18 years old and if the school is open as well. They're not going to leave if the school's not open and they're not going to leave if their age is greater than 18. Okay. Um, and there's actually one here whereby they can run errands. If work is closed, they can still run errands in the community. Um, 
uh, and in in some mornings. Anyway, um, so uh, this has a theory of personhood and governing their location at a given time. That's fairly fun grain, fairly granular, right? Are they at work? Are they at home in the community? Are they at school for a given person? And they're going to alternate amongst these. But that's not all. This theory, so this is a dynamic theory and involves change over time. But here over to the right is an additional element to sort of component of that theory. Um, involving their infection status. Specifically, with respect to infection, we say someone's susceptible to infection. Someone's in, currently infected, and by implication, infected, and recovered, or, or excuse me, or recovered. They're in one, with respect to their infection, they're in exactly one state. These states are collectively exhaustive. They describe all the possibilities for infection status, those three states. They're in one or the other, and they're mutually exclusive. If you're in one, you're not in another. If you're susceptible, it means you're not infected. If you're infected, you're not recovered, you're susceptible. So these states are mutually exclusive, collectively exhausted. And we describe the things that change those states um, in the rules under which they apply. Here, the rules are going to be somewhat different. For example, someone's going to recover if they're infected. They're going to recover with a certain, what we would call in vice statistics, a hazard rate. A technical term for it is temporal probability density, a chance per unit time, a 10% chance per day you could be forgiven for thinking of this. Um, but sort of continuously applying. Um, so if they are effective, they have a, it could be excused for thinking of as kind of flipping a weighted coin and 10% chance of recovery per day, but it's a little bit more involved than that um, because they're, they could leave at any time in the process, but it's it's, it's nothing to look for. By contrast, if you look at the infection status, um, uh, or excuse me, the infection transition, going from susceptible to infective, there it'll be triggered by something rather different. They receive a message. And a message is going to reflect the main mechanism by which one agent interacts with other agents here. And serve additional purposes, but but that's one of the major ones. So they can become infected by another agent. Okay. And broadly, there's going to be some actions that take place upon infection, but um, those are going to be some of the transitions. So what we see is there's this Theory of personhood for a person involves schools and workplaces and homes and age and interaction among them. And, and it leads to evolution among their uh, location and among their infection status. System science. It's about the sciences. And, it, and it's about understanding not merely the pieces, but the interconnections between. And, and here, I hope you'll appreciate that while these are two different state charts, they are not solitudes uh, to each other. Um, someone's someone's location, for example, can influence their infection status. And we'll see that writ large. If they're at home and there's another infected person, it can lead to them being infected, for example. Okay. So we have some sort of... Um, Mildly articulated theory of personhood. Okay. Um, and I want to relate this to uh, a topic um, which uh, is, is going to um, uh, it's going to be illustrative of, of models uh, in general here. And forgive me, I should have these slides up, but um, I'm just going to uh, Get, uh, so this is uh, overview of uh, okay, um, oh, overview of ABM model. Here we go. Um, so I'm just going to call this up, and I want to use this example to illustrate some principles within these slides at the same time. So agent-based models seeks to understand the behavior of complex systems through 
really the lens of H and H and H and environment interaction. Within H and based modeling as a tradition, H and H and interactions and H and environment interactions are often the centerpiece of attention. It is about evolving agents over time. In contrast to micro simulation, though, which is another individual based tradition, in agent based modeling, often the real attention is on how agents interact and how they interact with the environment. You can't simulate agents in isolation in kind of a way that plays out each out over time. And there's value to that, but often as a general rule, we're interested in how they interact. Um, and and, and these are models which are going to simulate each person interactions or behavior over time, but it's going to give rise to higher level behavior. Okay. Um, so to see this, I want to flip back to that model. Here we go. Okay. And I want to run a face, I want to run a scenario. So I spoke with you from this podium, not three hours since, about how simulation models. Provide a theory that is operationalized at a precise enough level we can see. So, with this simulation, we have specific enough assumptions. We can ask what is its behavior over time? And, amongst other things, we could see if that's consistent with what we observe in the world, what people would experience, uh, account for from the world, and, and their, their journeys over time, et cetera. So, let's go do that. So over here on the left-hand side, if, if you don't see this, if you're still zoomed in, you'll want to double click on this to zoom out so you can see these projects. Okay, remember, you, you, you need to see this projects window. Anyone need help here from a TA? This is the first time you're exploring the interface and I can understand if you're getting lost. Anyone need help online? In person, okay? We okay? Okay. Um, okay. Um, so typically that means either no one needs help or people feel they're beyond help. Um, <laughs> I'm hoping it's no one needs help. Um, let us know if you feel hopeless and we'll, we'll TAs will flock to your side and provide um, help to, to you. Okay, so over here on this project side, beyond these pieces of the model, we'll see some things with X. X marks the spot, ladies and gentlemen, for experiments. Personally, I, I think that's a poor term. Um, and let any lesser know my judgment. Um, but over here, say if I've changed, I would call it a scenario. We're running this theory with certain specific assumptions about particular like population size, with like whether schools are open or workplaces are open, open, et cetera, in a given scenario. So we're taking the same basic model and just changing our assumptions about particular. So let's go to the baseline and I'm going to right click on this baseline like that. Now a Wade will intone in a stentorian voice what the corresponding key is on a map. Yeah, control click on the Mac if you haven't enabled right click. Okay, control click on the Mac if you haven't enabled right click. Um, thank you, Wade. Um, uh, yeah? I, I dare say it doesn't look like we have any more Windows users online. I don't know if there's any local. Any non local. Okay, users. yeah. If there's any non Windows users, just let us know and, and we'll help translate this. But you can right click on this and do run if you get this context menu. Another thing you can do, in general, in any logic, there's many ways you can do things. You can use this button up here and say, I want to run by pulling down this little thing here. I want to run the neighborhood mobility. Wait, I have a question. If I highlight this and I just press this button, will it automatically know to execute that particular one? No. No. Thank you. Um, so uh, everyone needs a good wage. Um, okay, so we can pull this down and choose that, or you can right click on this. Um, there's also a way up here to do run and you can choose it that way. So pick your poison. 
I'm going to pick this one because I find it specific visually for which one I'm running. And I'm going to click run. Okay. And up will come. So remember, this is a theory precise enough to be operationalized. And it is operationalized at a precise enough level to be run, I should say. So here I'm running. And, and, and you see the, the implications writ large of, of my theory. If you click this little button over here, you'll see something called the developer panel. And you will see it playing out information over time. And, and you will see it reporting things here. And you'll see it rather distressingly report infections of various agents. And you'll see over here, um, there's a set of agents at the schools and at the uh, at the factory shown as, as in yellow and red, respectively. But you'll notice that an un, a troubling fraction of these agents are now appearing red, not, not merely not merely green. Does anyone want to conjecture, speculate as to what red would mean as opposed to green? Green signals there in fine health. What do you think red might mean? By our theory of infection, we saw it earlier, they are infected in the red state, and they're going to turn gray when they become recovered. Hence the color coding here, if you if you look. Um, so what, what we see is people are getting infected. <laughs> see them here, like at this factory, there's a set of, this workplace, there was a set of people um, sharing that factory, some of whom were infected, some of whom were susceptible. And at this home, and at this home, and at this home, there's people with discordant infection status. In other words, it's mixed. And you'll see that people are growing infected. But, but ladies and gentlemen, this is a you know a lot of a lot of detail, a welter of detail. Let's let's look at it from a higher level perspective. And to do this, I'd like you to click and drag down. Okay. And what you will see is a set of summaries that lie above us. <laughs> as time plays out, we're up to about 140 hours, as indicated in this developer yeah. panel to the right. <laughs> and we'll see a counter effect here on the right. A prevalence of infection at any one time, a fraction of the population that's infected right now on the left-hand side. And we'll see most distressing that it's risen to about 75% in lives. Further up, we can see a histogram of the numbers of times different people in the population have been infected. And we see that indeed, um, now a, a large fraction of people uh, have been um, count of times infected one. But further up yet, what we see is a report on what do you think this report? It has, for example, travel context, workplace context, home context, school context. Anyone want to hazard a guess as to what that is? Source of the infection. Source of infection, where the transmission took place. When they got infected, was it at a workplace? Was it at a home? Was it at a school? Mm. Um, so we, we have these kind of running statistics, but it's playing out at a rather stately pace. And I'd like to speed it up, if I may. I can do so in two ways. One is I can press this button here and time speeds up two times its, its previous rate, um, five times its previous rate, 10 times its previous rate. Or I can run it indeed with this button, which is the, the uh, uh, virtual button. I, mean, I haven't pressed that yet. We'll see that in a minute. Now we see many people are remain infected. That's the red, but others are gray. What does gray mean? Does anyone remember? Recover. Now we could drill down here. Listen, we're seeing high level reports, but let's go over here on the right hand side and we could drill down to the population. How do I do that? Well, I have this panel up. If you didn't bring it up, you can click here, bring it up and you can click down here and you can choose population. Mm -hmm. But there's many people in the population. This is population member zero. What state are they in? 
Anyone want to conjecture? I'll give you a hint. Red indicates the state they're in, the red border. What's In what state are they located? They're recovered. Where are they right now? Oh, they're at home, they're at work, they're in the community. They're at home, they're at work. They're, they're moving between them according to the schedule, right? They're commuting to work, they're at work, they're going and running errands, and they're coming back home. Um, here's where they're recovered. Now, so each person in the population has a story. Each person in the population, if we scroll over, has a count of times they've been infected. Uh, they're, they're at a certain place. They have an, a certain in, infection status right now. But if we scroll up and we go look back here, up there, there's a collective story, too, oh, that's playing out over time, right? The number of cumulative infections is about the full population size. The prevalence of infection peaked, and now it's being brought down. And we can see, if we scroll up, where those infections took place. What was the most common place in which the infections <laughs> took place? Can anyone say? Home and deep. Workplaces. Okay, so what's going on here? Let's go back to those slides. Let's go look. And I, I know these slides aren't 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 yet uh, posted. I'll post them over lunch. Um, uh, so these ABMs are upwards facing in the sense we specify behavior of a situated agent in a certain context um, enough to, to specify how they evolve over time, interaction with others. And then we study how that influences the behavior of the whole, the overall behavior of the system. Remember, it's system science after all. Um, and uh, within this context, um, we have outputs. We've, we've seen those up, up, up here, different sorts of outputs summarizing the behavior of this model. We have populations. Indeed, in, in this model, we have populations involving, in Maine, a uh, population of people. There's, there's more static, um, passive populations of schools, workplaces, community places, which are actually captured uh, as sort of singularly sort of simple agents. They're parameters that specify assumptions. Uh, that's what we saw at a level of the whole population and things like population size. The, the connection distance by which to connect people, whether school is open or not, or work is open. But we also saw parameters at an individual level. Um, uh, the assumptions about a particular person, and if we were to scroll down here and we were to zoom out, a given person has a, a, a home. That's a, that's a parameter. An age in years. This one is just short of 39 years old. They have a certain school or, or workplace with which you're associated. There are actions that change their state and there's rules that govern those actions, like them leaving home in 14 days if work is open and they're 18 or more. There's some time horizon. We're running this out over a specific period of time. And for those interested, that's specified for a given scenario in the model time area here. It says go to... 8,760 hours, which is, happens to be one year. Um, uh, beyond that, uh, we have interventions that we could simulate. To see that, let's, let's run this at full speed, if we may. Hearing no objections, I'm going to run it. Okay, time moves fast, ladies and gentlemen. Empires rise and fall. We see, we see time of, actually, it's just a year. So it's just playing out this model is 500 population and all their interactions over this year. People are moving to work, moving to home, going to the community, getting infected or some places. And now we've reached one year. And how many people got collectively infected? Well, gosh, 500 people. That's the entire population. The prevalence of infection went up to about seven, um, 75% at its peak and then came down and more or less went extinct after a uh, time about 1500. To talk about interventions, let's let's go dive down. Let's let's delve a little bit deeper if we may. So I'm going to stop this model here. You could also stop it up here. Remember, there's many ways to to stop these models. Okay. So here we go. So I've stopped the model 
and we're back to our depiction of our theory. We're back to this depiction of theory and different scenarios, which we can use to simulate the theory. We ran a baseline scenario, a reference scenario, not necessarily privileged, but just a scenario to which we can compare things. Often, not always, it's, it, it's kind of a business as usual scenario, or default as it were scenario. And that scenario involved, we click on it, certain assumptions about this, particular assumptions to make about this theory. So if we click on this, this baseline, we click on parameters, we'll see that we made the assumption of a 500 person population, okay. A certain number of contacts per day and mean community visits, going shopping or whatever per day, and whether or not school is open. Do you think school is open or closed and work is open or closed based on what you see here? Can anyone tell me? Is work, work, are workplaces open or closed or school open or closed? Anyone? Both are open, hence the check boxes. Okay. Uh, good question. Why the workplaces were constantly red? Um, uh, the workplace is a uh, good question. Let's, uh, I'm going to run that scenario just so we can, can see this again here. Okay. I'm going to run it. Okay. Um, and and uh, the, the question was, uh, why are the workplaces red? They are colored red. There's no significance. Uh, that happens to be uh, the color of a workplace here. Um, it's just a picture in this case. What's more germane, so, so that communicates as it turns out, no information about the status of the model. It just happens to be a, an artifact of, of the picture that's used. In no ways does it communicate anything about infection status. If you want to understand something about infection status, you should look at who's in the workplace and the, the colors of them. And so uh, in the fullness of time, as you will see, okay, here are a bunch of people in the workplace. This uh, school has some is discordant status. This workplace has some has an infected person, as does this one. This workplace and this workplace are free of infection by appearances. So yeah, this color that this is yellow. That um, so th these are homes here in blue. These are yellow schools. These are these boxes are community stores. Maybe they're big box stores. Um, and here we have a workplace in red. Uh, they they can know nothing about um, uh, about the infection status. It's just an artifact. Thank you. Three yes, um, uh, EGA. Yeah. Does any logic has color blend friendly? Color okay. friendly. Good question. I'm not aware of of that having been a feature put into place. Does anyone? Can anyone comment on that? Some kind of a yeah, yeah, no, it's, it'll be a great accessibility uh, investment. Anyone know? For the animation, you could just select different colors instead of red and green. That's certainly true. But in terms of like built-in affordances. Yeah, yeah, so right now, I, um, uh, that that's a suggestion I could bring to their team. Um, uh, they've incorporated actually a bunch of features because of our requests. So it's, it's not a, a casual thing. Um, so uh, we could do that. So I'm running this model again. You actually notice there's a bit of a difference. The peak infection prevalence. Anyone remember what that was before? 75. About 75. Now it's about 80, a little bit over 80. So what we're seeing is the effects of stochastics. And we're going to see that writ large. But I want to get back to this intervention. So I'm going to go. So agent-based models have one or more populations with agents. They're each associated with parameters. Think, it's my home. What's my age, right? State, that's collectively uh, the population members. The persons here have a state. It's, it's collectively given by this state chart on the one hand, or this state chart over here on the other for their location related concerns, it's given by these states for their infection concerns, it's these. These two are logically distinct. Um, uh, they can influence each other, but you can specify their infection status separately from their from their location. Um, so we have parameters like their age, their state, which is collectively described in this case by those state charts. Let's 
some history information, like how many times have been elected. They have actions. Those are things that change the state. That's that's these kind of these these uh, arrows there. Um, rules for evolving the state. The the things that govern, for example, under what conditions does someone recover? That ten percent chance per day, um, roughly speaking, or that I go from here to here based on infection. And then means of interaction with other agents. So here. Their, their, their interaction with our agents is spatial immediate. They're, they're placed in space and they're connecting with people, I'll just tell you, who lie within a certain distance uh, of each other. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so let's, um, though, uh, and, and there's a time horizon over which I'm running it. And so there's some initial state. There's there's a bigger vo modeling vocabulary. If you're from... Um, just my name, I just up. A wonderful tradition, one where I, 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 can, I have for, for three decades now, um, practiced in and continue to practice as well, um, alongside and in, in jointly with agent based modeling. In such dynamics, the modeling vocabulary, the building blocks, are much smaller, much tighter. Um, here, uh, there's a bigger modeling vocabulary. Um, uh, we have many, many types of things to learn about. Um, Okay, um, so we have these model populations, we have these parameters, particular assumptions about particular people, right? Like their age, their home. These, these can be discrete assumptions, like what's my age group or um, whether I'm born in Canada or not. What's my immigration status? They could be continuous. Like, what's my age as a continuous number? Um, what's my viral load level right now? Um, or what's my what's my weight at birth for a brand fixed thing? Um, they can also be relational, like who's my mother or what's uh, what's my home? Um, what's my workplace? They can refer to another agent. Beyond these, we have these states. Um, these different states that we can be in, and we have these state transitions, and um, and we have uh, means of interaction with objects. And in many cases, these are captured with messages. And you see that here, that they go from here to here when they receive a message. A message um, is often the way one agent influences another. It's not the only way, but it's the main way, by far the dominant. Okay, so we're seeing some of these kind of principles of, of agent-based modeling um, in effect, um, and sometimes it's meted by networks and um, sometimes by spatial, spatial embedding, so we can put people in space, and that's what we have here. We have people in the spatial context. They move between workplace and home, et cetera. Um, now, notably, there's emergent behavior. I told you. From this podium um, this morning, I spoke of the fact that complex systems mm, um, have these different characteristics um, that give rise to generative behavior. So I spoke about how we have feedbacks and nonlinearities and interagent interactions and localized effects and perceptions and delays. And these give rise to properties, to things like there can be tipping points in the model. There can be lock-in effects, whereby if you go, if you if you consider the um, the amount of effort early on to go from one from one sort of uh, stable state to another, um, that's far far less than once you go into one of those stable states. It's much harder to get out. For example, think about substance use. Getting caught up in a cycle of of, of substance use makes it much, much harder to get out than, than it would be to prevent it in the first place. Or think about adverse outcomes coming out of you know adverse childhood experiences. Um, we have path dependence, but one of the biggest ones is emergence. And what I'm telling you here is if we run this baseline scenario, what we are seeing writ large, we have this theory about, about things at an individual level, but what we see writ large for the whole 
is emergent behavior. Behavior that is implied by the behavior of each person. But in order to see that in, in a nonlinear system, you have to simulate it. You can't figure it out in what we call closed form mathematically. We can't write down a formula for how it's going to change over time for a nonlinear model. We have to step by step simulate how it changes over time. This, ladies and gentlemen, is emergent behavior. And in order to, to, to see the emergent behavior implied by a theory with particular assumptions, we have to simulate them all, full stop. Okay, um, so we've seen many of these, these principles here, um, but I, I, I need to, to, to sort of um, cap this off. By the way, in age-based modeling, those emergent patterns can be over time but also over space, like different workplaces have different levels of infection or different homes based on the number of people at the home. Um, and we can see behavior over networks, okay? We can, we can see this implied by the model structure. When we see it implied, we can't track it down to any one thing. We have other models I sometimes use to illustrate this with you know, a simple SIR model, and you get patterns out like this with waves of infection. That's not in any way directly encoded by the model. There's nothing that says how long each wave is and that the red or in the outer part of the ray wave and the, and the gray or in the inner part of the wave. That's not in any way encoded in the model. Rather, it emerges from, it results from the interaction of many factors in the model. And it cannot be reduced to any one factor, just like with our model. This behavior we observe cannot be reduced to any one thing. Is it a reflection about certain assumptions? Does it reflect our assumption about how the, the, the stages of infection, if we had it exposed, would it be different? Would it look different? Yeah, it would look different. Does it have to do with our recovery assumption? Absolutely. Does it have to do with our assumption about how people circulate in the population? As it turns out, yes. If we have work from home orders and school closures, we will see different outcomes. But it cannot be traced down. This behavior cannot be traced down to any one of those assumptions or simply the sum of the results of each assumption in isolation. You have to simulate them together in a nonlinear system. You can't separate it neatly out. In linear systems, as some of you might know from engineering training or applied math, in a linear system, Going with feedbacks, we can analyze linear time invariant system. We can analyze it in ways that can represent the behavior of the system as a as a sum, as a superposition of these different behaviors of of each what we call normal mode or 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 sort of eigen mode of the system. Each each um, separate behavior. We can we can essentially untangle it with the right type of of analysis. With a linear system, with a nonlinear, that's out the window. Um, you can linearize it at any one time, but you can't write down in closed form how it will behave as a sum of things. It's it's more than the sum of its parts. Okay, so that was our baseline. Um, I'm going to to say, well, what if we close schools? Okay, so to do this, we're going to run a different scenario. Here we have a set of scenarios. I'm going to close the schools here. Okay. Here we go. We're going to run an alternative assumption. We're going to run the same model with different particulars, particular assumptions, particularly assumptions here about the intervention regime, about the public health rule that's in effect right now. So I'm going to run it, and, and you'll see at first very little difference. Um, time marches on. We're in the first day. Uh, oh, my goodness. Um, okay. Okay. Um, uh, and uh, we're simulating out. We start with just one infective, and we start simulating it, and time moves on. Um, lunch beckons, and I'm going to uh, speed this up. Um, we're going to run it at full tilt, and we're going to see the effects writ large. Mind you, here, we have schools closed. How many people do you think will be infected in the schools if the schools are closed? Zero. Darn right. <laughs> Good call, Luigi. Yeah, um, that's exactly right. Um, 
And if you scroll up, yeah, you'll see, okay, schools have zero. Homes actually have proportionally more. Why, why would there be more people? So, so it makes sense, right? If schools are closed, there's, there's fewer. In fact, zero infections taking place at schools. Ain't, ain't no one going to the school if I could lapse into the vernacular. Why would you have more people infected at home? Anyone? for our kids spending the time yes. at home, right? <laughs> and, and so more infections, more of the infections that infect them happen to occur, you know, in the home, right? Um, that doesn't mean it's bad. Let's go assess whether, you know, it, it did it, how much did it save, right? Um, first, we'll look at the prevalence. Look at that. Now we have a max prevalence of 0.7. Is that a bit hopeful? Hmm? A bit, maybe, but we know there's variation, right? Let's, um, and uh, we can go check that out again. Let's 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 run it again. Um, well, notice if you go down to, in the scenario, go down to randomness. It's every time, and it's running it with a different what's called random seed. The, the happenstance of each time is different. Who happens to have, you know, the exact time they recover or or who exactly is infected by an infected person within the family at any type of time. I'm going to run it again um, at full tilt. What did I do? I just went, I right-clicked on it again, I ran it at full tilt, and I'm going to see, hey, does it yield a similar peak? Well, you know, this time it got up to about 0.72. And I could run it again and run it again. It does seem a little bit lower. How about in terms of cumulative infections? Did it, did it lower it? It did. It went down from 500 to 491. Did it, did it save some infections? Yeah, I mean, we need like 0 0.005 fraction. Yeah, half a percent. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. So if you ran it again and again, yeah. So you can assess it, and that's what we do with statistical tests. We can ask, is it statistically significantly different? And that's that's an excellent and common, and in fact, in our work, uh, you know, almost universal thing that we do with model results because it's affected by stochastics. It's affected by sampling error, et cetera. Okay, um, let's now go though to a more aggressive intervention. So this was schools closed. Did it help? Yeah, it helped. How about work from home? Well, here with work, for, I, I should have emphasized, so with schools closed, what do we alter? Well, we changed. We said schools are not open, right? Work from home, how do you think, what are we saying there about our assumptions? How would our assumptions be different with respect to whether or not, you know, we have a certain population size contacts per day, schools, whether schools are open or work are open. If we want to simulate work from home, what would we do? We'd say that workplaces are what? Not open, okay. <laughs> I'm trying not to stand between you and lunch and we're, 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 we're getting them very close. Okay, so I'm gonna run this. I'm gonna right click and run it. So we're saying workplaces are not open. So that now means, well, the parents aren't going to school, right? Um, they're staying at home. The older folks like me are, are staying at home. Okay, here we go. We're running at a full tilt. Time goes on. Um, and what happened? Huh? Huh? What, what's going on? Where are the red? Where are the red things? Hmm? Team of infections. What happened? What happened, ladies and gentlemen? Riddle me this. Count of times infected. Well, basically everyone zero. How many infections were there across the entire population? One. One. One infection, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, that's that's a bit hopeful, right? Let's try that again. I mean, is that robust, right? Could that have been chance? Yeah, it could well have been because that person might have in fact might have recovered really quick. Yeah, the first group for eighteen. Yeah, and they didn't go to work. They, they didn't, they didn't go, go to work. That, and that, they were the only person in their home. That's so right. The actually. kids could have gone off to school, and they would have been working, recovering, and maybe okay. We've just ran it again. Same scenario. And what do we see here? Well. <laughs> it's not quite a sanguine, right? Um, it's still running. 
um, what's the peak? About, you know, about 0.68. Uh, does it look like it might've helped? Yeah, some. How many cumulative people got infected? Uh, 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 500, right? Um, okay. Um, so is it helping? Well, we'd have to, to, to really assess this, we need to run it a bunch of times to get robust sense, right? To, to be assured we're not merely dealing with a fluke of behavior for these particular runs. And, and we could run it many times. And, and, you know, standard modeling practice involves exactly that. You run what are called ensembles of models. You run it maybe a hundred times, right? And you, and you assess the statistical significance of the results from one intervention to another, maybe with the Man whitney one way U test, the Wilcoxon, uh, or maybe you used a Kolmogorov Smirnov test to test if two things are, are, are in common. Here, do we help? Well, it, it does seem a lower peak prevalence, but how many people got infected by the end? <laughs> Everyone except one per. Look at that. Lucky, lucky. Look, that person seems to be living alone. Um. Okay. Um. Go figure. Right. Um. So, um, did we help? Well, um, maybe maybe what what we did is we spread out the infection. We. We we flattened the curve, but we didn't we didn't stop people. Everyone, almost everyone, can getting affected. Now let's run them together, though. So we had schools closed and work from them. Pretty pretty weak medicine by themselves. Um, let's go and look at uh, how about schools closed, work from home, normal community visitations. How about that one? So here we're go click on that. Can you tell me what is this one involved? How is that different from the two ones we looked at in isolation? Anyone? Look at look at the settings over here on the right, the assumptions about this particular scenario. We're going to run the same model, same theory with different particular assumptions. And what are the particular assumptions? How do they differ? Yeah, so are both not open? Now, I want to ask you, this were a linear model. Um, if we ran it with schools closed and we got a certain reduction in effect, and then we ran it separately with workplaces closed and we got a certain reduction in infection. If we ran it with, with both disabled, we, we'd expect to see the sum of those gains. The gain of, of having both together would be the sum of the gains of having each in isolation. Do you think that's necessarily the case here? Do you think that's a given here? The answer is no, because this is a nonlinear model. We can't just neatly separate out and simulate each in isolation, just sum them up. That's how a linear time invariance is going to work. It's not how a nonlinear is going to work. And you know, if we have a nonlinear function for those mathematically more, more inclined in general for a nonlinear function, this is not equal to in general f of x plus f of y, right? Mm -hmm. It's not homomorphic anyway. Um okay, so um so let's those two don't commute. So okay, so we're gonna we're gonna run this scenario. And we're ready to accept the fact, I hope, intellectually, that the results could be quite different in terms of gains from the results from each in isolation, right? That's what we've just said. Okay, so we're running this. Did the infection die out? No, it didn't die out. We're down to about 0.6. Um, and we are here in terms of gains down to about 495. Eh. It it could have reduced it more than one would think, but it's not clear. I mean, let's let's run it again. And of course, we do this in an automated way, and any logic provides us great avenues for doing that that we will discuss during the boot camp, running it again and again and again, so that you don't have to click your route to, to death. Right. Now it's down to about 0.5, but the total number that got infected or is is still way up there, right? Maybe it in terms of this metric, maybe it's more than the sum of the parts, but it sure doesn't seem to be getting the cumulative 
um, number down as much as we really would like. Both together do seem to lower the peak, but not so much the the, the number of cumulatively uh, infected. Here we go again. Okay, down to about 0.6, and we seem to be maxing out about 495. Okay. So, running short. Just those two are just not enough given these infections characteristics. I'd like to ask, how if with the baseline, how if we didn't we didn't have um, schools closed? We didn't have workplaces closed. But what we do instead is we posit an, a 10% reduction in how frequently people are going to community places to mix in. Thank you, Wade, for noting that. So, so what this will mean at a person level, right, is that um, right now they kind of go to work, they go to school, if, if workplaces and schools are open, and then they go to a community and with a certain probability, they'll go to intransient community, that, according to this probability given by mean community visits per day. So if that's right now one, as it is for the baseline, they will go, um, they will go to the community and engage in, you know, Mexican, they'll, they'll visit stores, they'll go to coffee houses, they will um, bring their kids to the dance studio, whatever. Um, they go to the community and then they run home. So for baseline, we assume um, that basically each day they engage in some community mixing. What if for this alternative scenario, we reduce that by 10%? We have less mixing in the community. They're still going to school. School is open, workplace is open, but they have less community visitation per day. How do you think that would impact things? Hmm? How do you think that would impact things if they have less community visitation? Will it change the number of infections? Will it change the peak? How much will it lower the peak? Will it change the cumulative number? These are, these are not easy things to do in our head, right? Right? So we turn to computers to do things that are really dumb very quickly, like very, very mechanical things, very, very quickly. Those are things computers can sell, not the only Those are areas where computers can sell, do the same thing over and over again, what, so it, in, in, in a more consistent way than we can do in our head. So let's run it. We don't have to muse about it. We don't have to write long paragraphs guessing what it would be. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna see the logical implications of those assumptions with this theory of the world by running it, by goodness. And I'm going to run it out here and I'm simulating it out and, and we see, okay, here we add 0.65 and, ooh, to, you know, there's, there's some lowering of the cumulative infections. Look, it's down to 472. Was that bigger gain or less gain than we got by closing schools for the for the anecdotal evidence we got through running it a few times. It's a bigger gain um, in, in lowering infection, cumulative infections. Um, was it bigger than for closing workspaces or less than closing workspaces? Yeah, it was bigger, good. Um, uh, so we're gonna, we're gonna run it uh, another time here. Here we are. And what we see again is it got to about 485, right? After about 485, um, the, the, the infection basically goes extinct. It gets down to about 0.65. It doesn't smooth it out quite as much, but it, it's, it's lowering it some. Now, how about for the final code, for the final crescendo, we combine that with school closures? Can we? With your leave? Thank you. Um, hearing no objections, I will combine that. So here we go. Schools closed, work from home, 10% community visitation reduction. What it lacks in brevity, it makes up for in expressiveness. <laughs> right? <laughs> okay. Um, doesn't leave a lot to the imagination. Okay, we're going to run it. Um, 
my students are not unfamiliar with that <laughs> with that commitment to clarity and 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 uh explication of names we're going to run it time passes empires rise on rise and fall what happened how many people got infected can anyone say five ladies and gentlemen five folks where did they get infected four at home one and one during travel okay let's run it again could have been a fluke right could have just been a lucky draw but it did infect five not just it's not like the first person just recovered you know before they infected anyone it wasn't just one person okay we, we ran it okay how many people infected? 40, 49, right? Cumulatively, where did they get infected? Well, home, some some in community, okay. some travel. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, okay. Um, by the way, why not in the school or why not in the workplace for that one? Because they're closed, right? By assumptions here. We're combining those and reduced community visitation. People can, are still going to the community just at, at reduced rates, 10% less. 10% less, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to run it again. Time moves on. 43 infected. Was the curve bent? Speak on as if in a Greek chorus. Yes, it was reduced, okay? Um. We seem to be on to something here. And of course, we'd need to test it with all the evidence of non-parametric statistics and so on, whether it's significantly reduced the the uh, the burden. Um, but the picture is at least at this point anecdotally pretty pretty uh suggestive, right? Um we're getting consistently counts of infections less than a hundred and sometimes less than fifty. Right? We're all three together. Notably, the whole is different from the sum of the parts. The gain from workplace closure in isolation, school closure in isolation, reduced visitation in the community by 10%. Each of those in isolation, consider their gains. It's quite modest, quite modest. But if we consider them together, the whole is different from the sum. We see a very different effect. And in fact, it's pretty close to a tipping where, where the infection just can't live there very quickly. Right? It, it gets off to a little bit, a few homes have gotten infected. Um, you can see, but but um we're able to, to really nip it in the bud. So we can ask these what if questions, ladies and gentlemen. Um uh and we have to be we have to do so conscious of stochastics, savvy to stochastics, to making sure that our runs are not merely outlier anecdotes, they're not merely flukes, right? Um, but the truth is the world, the world has a lot of stochastics. <laughs> we look at empirical data on many conditions, not least infection. Stochastics are at large, you can see them. You know, very, very pronounced in that data about from COVID-19 I showed you earlier. There's stochastics that are quite pronounced there. And so it actually turns out to be an asset. You could think of it as a bird to run it again, again, oh, come on. But it, it gives you insight sometimes as to why we see very little. And, you know, time has been that I have published papers with the confidence lent by simulation that this trend, while it might seem inconsistent with the theory, it can be caused purely by stochastics very readily. It can be explained very readily by stochastics. There's no problem. It's well within the range. And we can do this at a very fine grained level. We can do it with longitudinal data. We can do it with aggregate longitudinal data, et cetera. Um, it turns out we won't well in this, but we could have hierarchical models cities, within cities, neighborhoods, within neighborhood schools, within schools, particular um, children, et cetera. Um, okay. Um, so some notable strengths of ABMs, um, capturing heterogeneity, agents that are quite different in their characteristics. 
different in their discrete characteristic difference and their continuous characteristic, their birth weight, for example. Uh, differences in their in their um, history sometimes. Um, uh, heterogeneity when it comes to populations that are particularly vulnerable or at risk. Heterogeneity in spatial context or network. Um, we can capture uh, the effects of those contexts, network, spatial, and even nested contexts like schools and kids in classrooms within schools, et cetera. Um, we can capture decision making, capture decision making on the part of agents. We haven't seen that here. We didn't have agents, for example, judge whether they want to work from home based on infections in the workplace, but we could have added that and it wouldn't have been terribly hard. Um, uh, we can capture intervention effects um, uh, in ways that are specific to particular agents. We can have different treatment regimens. For individuals coming in many times, the SDI clinic, perhaps with behavioral modification therapy or, or counseling for those who have been there more than once or twice, or for oral health, those who have had multiple occurrences of cavities can spend more time with a dental hygienist or, or dentist to talk about what's needed to help them in their you know, lived context. Uh, realize um, improved oral hygiene. We can have um, uh, interventions targeted by people's uh, uh, status uh, geographically, have geographically situated public health orders by their history, um, by their, by their uh, characteristics. Um, we can have visualization that helps us understand these things. So we've just tapped a little bit. We've seen patterns come out of the model where we're going to see a very powerful to combine agent-based models with effective visualization tools. And you can get a lot of insight and it's important to do so. Um, and then models can serve as, as important um, sources of insight. Um, okay, I think I'll stop there. Um, we have lunch before us um, and uh, a full afternoon uh, of behavior. I hope this information, or I hope I hope the subjects discussed here give you pause for thought. Um, and, and and helps you start to think about how to situate agent-based models as learning tools, as tools in the broader milieu of, of um, decision-making and with the broader toolbox of, of, of health science techniques. This afternoon, we'll be getting into some more specifics, building some of our first age, uh, state charts, for example, with agents and our first, indeed, agent-based models. But before that, you deserve a repast uh, worthy of the intensity of the material. So uh, we're going to break for lunch. The TAs um, will bring you uh, to the Marcus Hall where you can um, secure your sustenance. Um, and if some TA could take ownership over, over the, um, uh, the mail cards. And with your leave, uh, dear participants, I will take the lunch hour and rest my voice. Thank you. What time will we reconvene? Um, let's reconvene in, in, can we do an hour or is that too short? Okay. We'll reconvene at uh, 1.45. Yeah, yeah, uh, in local time. So that's, yeah, let's let's say, say um, for simplicity, uh, an hour from now, that will give people a bit of time to, to mostly back. Um, uh, and get some refreshments here, et cetera. Okay, thank you uh, everyone.